Hello and welcome back to Heights Library's podcast, Unpacking 1619, where you can explore the interviews we've collected with scholars from around the country, in which we unpack topics relating to race in America. I'm your host, John Pichet, and I'm thrilled to share these interviews with you here. New York University professor Pamela Newkirk and I talk about her book, Diversity Incorporated, The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business. We discuss the history of exclusion, the role of Presidents Johnson and Reagan, and why higher education is such a battleground for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Here is our conversation from September 14th, 2022. I'm Pamela Newkirk, and I believe I'm here because you're interviewing me about my latest book, Diversity, Inc. And um, I'm a professor at New York University and a journalist, and that's it. Perfect. Thank you for uh, the introduction. And uh, as you said, we are talking about your new book, Diversity, Inc., uh, The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business. And could you uh, maybe give us a little overview of how you came to write the book and what um, what you learned while doing it? Sure. So, yeah, um, I what motivated me to write the book is that um, for the many years that I have worked both in academia and in journalism, diversity had been a preoccupation of just like every newsroom I worked in. And uh, once I joined the faculty at New York University, And while there was so much um, talk about diversity, I noticed that every place I had worked, there was no diversity. Um, And three of four newsrooms I worked in, I was the only African-American reporter for a a long time at New York University. I was the only uh, tenured African-American woman in the entire College of Arts and Science. So not just in journalism, but that covered every um, um, field in, in uh, you know, history, English, mathematics. Uh, and so I wanted to interrogate the tension between the incessant talk about diversity, the uh, multi-billion dollar industry that had blossomed around it with the chief diversity officers and, you know, these, these bloated operations that existed in law firms and in, in just about every company and the lack of diversity. So what was it that had occurred over the past 50 years that diversity has been this dominant, you know, um, buzzword in in our culture? What had happened to make diversity um, such a topic, topic of conversation yet resulting in no diversity? So, so that, that was the, the impetus for the book. Well, thank you for that overview. And I, I think we should probably start with an idea of um, we're coming to some consensus about what diversity means. And, you know, not only in the context of kind of what you're talking about, this business aspect, but also in a larger kind of uh, corporate or business culture. Yeah, so that's that that was part of what I wanted to look at. So when we say diversity, what do we even mean? And one of the things that I discovered early on is that diversity has come to mean all things to all people. <laughs> diversity um, could could mean everything from geographic diversity to racial diversity to gender diversity to um, uh, you know uh, able ableism diversity. Um, And so I wanted to specifically look at racial diversity because I think that um, because diversity has become this umbrella that covers so much that it really had no bearing on racial diversity. In other words, a company could consider itself diverse and have no people of color, (laughs) right? Um, And it also assumes that people of color don't also um, fall under the umbrella of, um, uh, you know, everything from gender to 
economics to geography. So I wanted to specifically look at racial diversity so that we can have a conversation that actually meant something, <laughs> that we could all be on the same page. So in that way, I can look at the data to determine how race had fared over this 50 year long conversation about diversity. So that's what I focused on. And I, and I focused on the four largest uh, racial minority groups. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think you found that it hasn't fared very well, racial diversity. Right, so if you look at, it, so when you say diversity, if you looked at um, gender diversity, women have fared much better since this conversation began 50 years ago. But if you look at race, people of color have not really made many strides in decades. And in, and in fact, in, in many fields, uh, the, their numbers have, have fallen. Well, and I think we should probably go back uh, to this 50 year mark and kind of talk about, because in the book you talk, uh, kind of begin um, with Johnson and the, the, kind of the great society that he created and talk a little bit about the Kerner Commission and this, this movement that was really like a promise of inclusion and right. fixing the wrong and then how that moved into this Right. So, so yeah, it's a lot of history to try to, <laughs> to try to um, uh, put into a, a, a minute or two. But yeah, so after the civil rights movement, there there was this growing recognition of uh, uh, race and how it had um, impacted. Uh, specifically African-Americans, the civil rights movement uh, largely was focused on um, inequality uh, in, in this nation and, and, Afri and how African-Americans had fared. And so there were a number of um, uh, touch points, but one was the Kerner Commission report that you mentioned. Uh, so uh, President Johnson had impaneled the National Commission of Civil Disorders, which the shorthand is the Kerner Report. And, and, and that panel looked at a number of things. It looked at housing, education, and how, how African-Americans were faring um, in, in all of these different categories. And what it found is that race um, had, had been such had played such a role in how African-Americans lived, where they went to school, how they were depicted in the media. And it basically um, talked about injustice and, and how America and our government was implicated in, in the perpetuation of injustice against African-Americans. And, and so as a result of this landmark report, the Kerner Commission report, uh, Johnson implemented a number of measures and uh, I mean the the his great society programs were targeted at at um, you know correcting many of, of these problems uh, this kind of injustice and it was um, aimed at housing and education and hospitals and like just desegregating all of these institutions that had locked out African Americans and and kept them from from um, progressing in society and to a to a large degree the programs made a huge difference the the number of African Americans who were graduating not only from colleges and universities, but also from high school. Um, um, it, it just uh, made a huge difference in, uh, because it, what it did is it, it, it unlocked um, the doors of, of progress uh, that, that had been firmly shut uh, to African Americans, and so over years, uh, we we saw the needle move. Uh, we saw African Americans moving into fields to that had long uh, denied them access, including journalism, including um, universities, um, and so we saw the the needle move, and then with the election of Ronald Reagan, um, we saw many of those programs dismantled, and then we saw a lot of backsliding and those numbers from that point on. So from the 1980s on, we haven't really seen much progress when we look 
at um, the, the inclusion of African Americans in if, if we're looking at any influential field, the numbers have barely budged over the past uh, several decades, three, four decades. Yeah, that, that's interesting that the, the Reagan administration basically defunded a lot of these and then unregulated. Is that the... Yeah, and, and really stigmatized um, um, the kind of progress that had been made. You know, there were all of these attacks on affirmative action. Um, there, there, there was just this sense that um, the the people who were really disadvantaged were white Americans, not <laughs> not not um, you know populations who had long been denied access to to um, to the American dream, essentially. That's right. And, and you looked um, uh, at several different industries, and I kind of want to focus on U.S. education, if that's OK, uh, oh, sure. because, I mean, we do you did talk about Coca-Cola, the NFL and the film industry. And if you want to kind of briefly talk about that, but I want to kind of spend the majority talking about higher education, because I think it's such an illustration of how inclusion is. Well, we'll get to it in a minute. But. Yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about um, academia. You know, uh, I, I wanted to look at influential fields and the ones that really can be a game changer. So higher education to me um, is probably uh, one of the most important fields to look at because it can make the difference between opportunity and, and the lack uh, of opportunity. So um, yeah, I, I did pay sustained attention to higher education for that reason. Um, one of the things that I, I mean, reading the film industry, kind of uh, that, that entertainment aspect, I read a headline the other day about Netflix moving back from uh, some of their diversity programming to kind of focus more on middle America. So it, it's not only timely, but it's also uh, instructive on kind of how you work and, together. And yeah. And just think of middle America as if that does not include <laughs> African-Americans and other people of color. And that's just the point. You know, when, when we're talking about diversity, we're, we're, we're really thinking about what gets normalized and what, what um, is not. And so what has become normalized in our society is the exclusion of now what is 40 percent of of the population racial minorities right and so when we go into these environments whether it's a film company or a, a a university we've normalized the exclusion of people of color and that is why um African Americans make up something like four percent of university professors. Hispanics like three percent. Um, you know, so and that becomes just the norm, as if um, you know people who are you know African Americans and Latinos alone are like thirty percent of, of of the population, and yet we just don't expect them to be included in these spaces, whether it's a, a, a museums or. Um, you know, the, the, the top tier of corporations, or we just, we just have normalized their, their exclusion. So when I think of diversity, I'm not only thinking of some rosy picture of like, we are the world. I'm thinking about um, who gets included when we're talking about opportunity in America, when we're talking about the American dream, who is that dream for? Uh, what, it, what is the intent of that dream? And so, um, because it's easy to just talk about diversity as something that's just feel good, instead of talking about it as an issue of justice, right? When I was thinking too while you were speaking that like, you know, we, the white space seems to be, if you include even one character of color or person of color, somehow that's no longer a white space. Right. And then it, it excludes- And then it's, and then it's, it's diverse, right? <laughs> right, but then it also is like by inclusion, then you're excluding the majority of white people. And that, so like Netflix saying, we're gonna focus on the middle of America, it's code word for, we're moving back into white stories and white, you know. 
right. main characters and that kind of stuff. And that's, and, that's and even though you know it's counterintuitive that study after study has shown that diverse casts make the most money or are, are, are the most lucrative, um, whether we're talking about the box office or a television show. And yet um, it, it, it's just this issue of what we normalize, right? Well, then I kind of want to use this too to kind of talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you talk in the book about <clears throat> uh, campus hostility and the things that minorities had to face when they started um, being included into these uh, traditionally white segregated spaces. And this isn't things that happened in the 30s. This is stuff that happened in our lifetime. And so, still happens, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Maybe you could speak a little bit about how the campus hostility and uh, some of the, um, you know, the first inroads of diversity, and the, what they had to face. Yeah, well, you know, I just think it's the history of our country because our country is is rooted in in racial hierarchies and 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 in racial exclusion. Um, we have normalized that, and so people of color in spaces that had long been exclusively white is still jarring to some, and and that was true in the. In, in the 1960s, <laughs> um, and, and it's still true today. And, and that's, that's the unfortunate part of the research because the data is just uh, a reflection of attitudes and, and how, how little they have really changed, even though we managed to elect um, Barack Obama as a president like for, for, for eight years. And, and that has given people the sense that we've overcome our, our, our racial, uh, you know, issues of racial discrimination. But if you look at the data, you see that the needle has barely moved in, in decades. That what is that reflecting? It's reflecting these hardwired attitudes in our society that have not changed as, as much as we would like to think they have. Some of the reasons why they haven't changed, I think, are because, and this, I was struck by this in your uh, book about the, uh, in the chapters about education, uh, minorities are left to do the work and they're responsible for making everyone feel comfortable. So like when you were talking about Halloween costumes, um, you know, we don't want to, every the white response is we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but really what they want to, we want to be racist <laughs> is what they're basically saying. And we want you to be comfortable with it. <laughs> we don't want you to make a big deal of it. Exactly. And, and that emotional work is left to the minority person in the white space. And, and that seems to be. But the, I guess that that has been our history, right? And so uh, people of color are the ones who have to figure out how to fit into these spaces, but those spaces don't have to make any adjustments <laughs> to accommodate um, other people and other cultures and other um, uh ways of thinking uh, uh, about justice. And so, yeah, um, you know, race, it's it's such a huge, <laughs> huge topic, right? Uh, um, our country is, is, is just, um, has always been shadowed by this, this issue of race and the tension between our ideals and the reality of how we actually um, live uh, with with race and and it's it's often been a, a struggle. It's a struggle for everyone. It's a struggle for many white Americans because you know when you talk about education, we're talking about inculcated values and and um, ideas. And so when we look at even our premier institutions, for so many centuries they have they have embedded these ideas of race and 
uh, you know, white superiority and black inferiority. And this is not just something I'm throwing around. These <laughs> these were actual um, ideas that were rooted in science and in anthropology and in, in English literature. And everywhere you turn, there was this notion of racial superiority uh, when when you think of whites and 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 inferiority when you think of blacks and others and so it it we have not quite dismantled these systems of 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 oppression that that are embedded in in the academy and so how could we expect um just everyday people not to harbor certain attitudes about other people and really fear about other people and what what those people represent right um and 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 so that's why education is so key and that's why we're still seeing today these battles over curricula what could be taught what can't be taught we can't teach uh, students about slavery. Why? Because that makes white students uncomfortable. Yet that is our history. <laughs> and, and we're still living with the repercussions of that history, right? And so until we find a way to actually address the roots of racial injustice and that are rooted in these, these, these um, kind of uh, horrific pernicious attitudes around race until we can actually tackle that we're never going to make progress with diversity because if people are stigmatized demonized thought of less than of course they're not going to be included in influential fields of course they're not going to, you're not going to see them in in, in boardrooms and in, in you know in, in universities and leadership positions so education is so central to this whole conversation about diversity because it's not something that you can just hire away that you can just like hire chief diversity officer and voila, you're going to have diversity. First, you have to really tackle these attitudes that have kept us from living in a truly um, just society. Yeah, and I, I appreciated how you kind of illustrated those uh, systems of uh, so you pointed to two books. One was this two-volume uh, Negro Education, which kind of instituted this idea that uh, African Americans should only go into manual labor, and they weren't, um, you know, industrial education, focusing on agriculture, which of course harkens back to the, the slave systems and that kind of stuff and this was this this report was issued by the u.s education department right highly influential and it's kind of um directing the course of education this 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 dual track um educational system one for whites and one for blacks right and so these are the embedded um, ideas that that we're still wrestling with, that we're still living with. When you think of anthropology and how for centuries or more than a century, students at every influential school were taught that you had Europeans who, who were the most um, intellectually advanced. And at the bottom, you had Africans who 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 were barbaric, basically, um, in in one um, um, encyclopedia, Africans were compared to to apes, um, and and there were these like very fancy terms to describe <laughs> their their lack of advancement. So so all of these. Um, ways of thinking, the, uh, the pseudoscience that was mainstreamed into places like Harvard and Princeton and Yale and Columbia University, we're still living with that. And we see it reflected in film. We see it reflected in literature. Um, and so that is part of the work that has to be done before we can even you know, significantly address the, the matter of diversity. Well, and let's talk about the work as it is done uh, 
as you said, by diversity programs and kind of like, is it enough to just hire a diversity man, you know, manager or uh, do a training or do, you know, in service and what, what are the successes and what are the failures of these programs that we all kind of experience? Yeah, so so many studies have concluded that not only does training not help um, advance the cause of diversity, but in many instances, they make the problem worse. They trigger a backlash to diversity. They cause those who um, already were indifferent to become sort of against <laughs> diversity. And I know I've seen that in my own experience. Um, th these, these training programs are often painful for everyone involved. <laughs> like no one wants to sit through that, right? And so, um, so training doesn't work, and yet that is the the primary way that um, many institutions try to address issues of diversity. Chief diversity officers, there's a very high turnover. Um, one uh, study showed that. Um, the majority of chief diversity officers don't even have access to the data in their own institutions that would allow them to see where the problems lie. And if you can't see where the problems are, how can you fix them, right? Um, so there's a lot of frustration among chief diversity officers, very high turnover. Um, yet these are the ways that many institutions um, are basically paying lip service to diversity rather than really doing the work. And what does the work look like? Um, one of the places that I looked, well, I actually looked at two. Um, one was Columbia University, where you had a president who, who made diversity one of the uh, primary missions of, of, of his, his um, tenure. And then you had Coca-Cola that, um, after a landmark discrimination lawsuit settlement, they looked at all of the ways that inequality had sort of calcified um, in, 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 the, in the corporation. So they looked at everything from um, salaries to uh, bonuses to you know, all, you know, where people were, what levels they were, and they looked across race, ac across gender. And what they found was probably not that surprising. They found that African Americans made far less than uh, even their peers, people in the same rank, same, same position as, as they held. They found that um, African Americans were kind of um, clustered in the lowest levels of the company, that they um, had fewer bonuses, less opp fewer opportunities for advancement. They found all of the, 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 the things that you could probably find in many <laughs> institutions, but there was transparency. So they, you were actually able, because they opened it up in a way that you can actually see um, you know, we, how injustice had become embedded in the entire institution, right? And once they could see that, then they could go about changing it by uh, having like a lot of sunlight on it. So anytime uh, someone was hired, they would look at, well, what did the candidate pool look like? How diverse was the candidate pool? They looked at, um, you know, who, who uh, uh, why wasn't this person hired? This person who was more qualified? Oh, well, maybe because they were a diverse candidates. So anyway, they were able to look a a across all of these categories and over a period, I, I believe, of like five years, they were able to actually change the culture and the complexion of, of, of the workplace um, and have a far more diverse uh, company uh, uh, along, you know, every level, every category in, in the company. And you saw far more diverse leadership and so that was one example, and it, um, uh, I, I can't really go through it in a, in a, I wrote a book because these things are complicated, right? Um, but so that was one example about how you actually can go about changing 
um, an institution and making it more diverse. And the other place I looked um, was Columbia University, uh, where Lee Bollinger had had made it a mission because he was at the University of Michigan when diversity was really challenged in higher education in two um, two cases. And and so he brought all that he learned um, from from those lawsuits to Columbia University. And anyway. The bottom line is what it takes to achieve diversity is leadership and tension, and there has to be some kind of accountability, right? You have to be able to um, actually have a plan and some kind of accountability and the leadership that cares to make to make a difference. Without that, you're, you'll have more of the same. And what we have now in, in our society are, are many institutions that are doing the same things over and over and over that don't work, <laughs> that will ensure that they will continue to have these homogenous workplaces. Right, and I think you, um, you kind of end the book with this um, idea that you know white America is the one that really has to make these changes. You can't expect that the minorities and, and the groups that are trying to diversify the workplace to do all the heavy lifting. You know, the resentment and the backlash and the, the, the lawsuits of, you know, people are saying, well, I was excluded because I was white. Those, those are the things that we have to fight against. Well, yeah. Sure. Yeah. But it's not easy to fight against those things when you have people in leadership who are perpetuating this idea of white victimization, right? Who are not actually looking at the numbers, which show that white, white Americans are still pretty much <laughs> holding most of the positions. In fact, they're, they're holding the lion's share of positions, even in places where they are themselves uh, racial minorities. And so, you know, without a clear eyed look at what's actually happening and not, you know, that's not like based on the fears that are fueled by all of this misinformation about, you know, people are taking over, they're taking our jobs, they're taking out. It's it, I mean, the numbers show that that's actually not what's happening. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, but it goes back to education and um, the ability to think critically, right? And that's something that um, we seem to be struggling with in this country right now. Well, uh, if you have any parting words and uh, hope for diversity uh, in the workplace, uh, what would they be for the future? Because I know you end the book with some. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, the, the, the biggest takeaway is there's not rocket science, that we can achieve diversity, that there are blueprints to follow for those institutions that are serious about it. But for those that are not, they can keep doing the same thing and they, they will get the same results. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Unpacking 1619. For more information on Heights Library 1619 Project Discussion Group, or to check out more interviews with scholars, please visit heightslibrary.org. See you next episode, wherever you listen to podcasts.